glycolysis consists of three different stages and previously we focused on stage one. So we said that in stage one, that glucose molecule is initially transformed into glucose 6-phosphate. And what that does is it traps that glucose in a cell and begins to destabilize that glucose. It makes it more reactive. Now, the second step in stage one is to basically transform the glucose isomer into the fructose isomer and we form fructose 6 phosphate. Now, the reason we have to form the fructose we'll talk about in just a moment. But the final step in stage one is to take that fructose, uh, fructose 6 phosphate and transform it into fructose 1 6 bisphosphate. And once we form the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, that molecule is reactive enough to go on to stage 2. And this is what I'd like to focus on in this lecture. So let's begin by describing what the general goal is of stage 2. So in stage 2, the entire point is to take that highly reactive fructose 1,6-bisphosphate molecule that was formed in stage 1 and to break it down and form two identical 3-carbon molecules we call glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates or GAP gap molecules. Now, in this stage, there are actually two different processes, and so we use two different enzymes. One enzyme is known as aldolase, and the other enzyme is known as triose phosphate uh, isomerase. So let's begin by focusing on aldose and discuss the reaction that, uh, not aldose, uh, aldolase, and the reaction that aldolase actually catalyzes. So aldolase is the enzyme that catalyzes the breakdown of that fructose 1,6-bisphosphate into two different 3-carbon molecules. And let's see exactly what these molecules are and what they look like. So let's begin with that fructose 1,6-bisphosphate in its cyclic form that is formed in stage 1. So once we form this, then that aldolase moves into this area. Now, before the aldolase can actually catalyze this reaction, this cyclic fructose must be transformed into its open chain counterpart. And that's because this is the form that will allow the aldolase to actually get to this bond and cleave that bond. So notice this molecule is color coded. So the purple region is what eventually becomes this product here, the glyceraldehyde, 3 phosphate, but the blue section here is what eventually becomes the other different 3 carbon molecule known as dihydroxyacetone phosphate or simply DHAP. So an enzyme called aldolase catalyzes the breakdown of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate that is produced in stage 1 into two different three carbon molecules, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate DHAP. Now, let's go back to a moment to stage one. So in stage one, the second step of stage one was to transform the glucose into the fructose isomer. The question is, why was that necessary? Well, the reason we transform the glucose into the fructose is so that once this step takes place in stage two, we form two molecules that each have three carbons. Because if that glucose was not transformed into fructose, and it's the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate that moved on to stage two, then once this reaction took place, in that case, we would have formed one molecule with two carbons and the other molecule with four carbons. And so to have this symmetry in which the two products have the same number of carbons, that's why in stage one, we have to transform that glucose into its isomer, fructose. Now let's take a look at these two products. Notice that one of these products is that product that we want to form in stage two. It's the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Now, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate actually lies directly on the pathway of glycolysis. And what that means is, once we form the gap molecule, it can go on directly into stage three without actually being modified in any way. But 
What about the other product? What about dihydroxyacetone phosphate? So this molecule, unlike this molecule, this one doesn't actually lie directly on the pathway of glycolysis. And so if this molecule is not actually modified in any way, if we leave these, this molecule as it is, it will not be able to move on to stage three. And so what will happen is we will essentially lose the potential to form ATP molecules in stage three, because if this one is not modified, it cannot go on to stage three. And so in the next step, what happens is, as we'll see in just a moment, this one is actually transformed into this one via an isomerization reaction. So actually these two molecules are in fact isomers. So once again, the glyceraldehyde phosphate lies directly on the glycolytic pathway, which means it could go on directly into stage three to form the ATP molecules, the pyruvate and the NADHs, as we'll see in the next lecture. But the dihydroxyacetone phosphate does not lie on that pathway directly. And this means that if the DHAP is not changed in any way, is not transformed into this gap molecule, then what will happen is we will not be able to continue that glycolysis process and therefore it will not be used to form those high energy ATP molecules that the cell needs so much to actually carry out processes. And so to prevent the loss of this potential energy that is uh, stored in this three carbon molecule, the DHAP has to transform that molecule into the GAP. And this is where that second enzyme comes into play. The second enzyme that uh, catalyzes the conversion of the DHAP into the GAP is known as triose phosphate isomerase or simply TPI. Sometimes we also call it TIM, TIM. So an enzyme called triose phosphate isomerase, TI, a TPI, catalyzes the rapid and the reversible conversion of the DHAP to the GAP. So rapid simply means it takes place very quickly and reversible means once we go this way, the enzyme also catalyzes that reverse reaction. In fact, once equilibrium is actually formed, this exists as the predominant molecule. In fact, 96% of the molecule is the DHAP and only 4% is the GAP. Now, why is that not a problem? Well, it's not a problem because by Lichtlia's principle, once the GAP is fed into stage three, it will be used up. And as soon as we use up this product molecule by Le Chatelier's principle, this will, the equilibrium will basically shift to the product side and this will be continually transformed into the product as we basically pull this away and feed it into stage three. Now, let's see exactly what triose phosphate, uh, triose phosphate actually does. So we have Carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon one, carbon two, carbon three. Now notice this is the same molecule as we have in this particular case. Now I've labeled this hydrogen as the blue hydrogen. And the reason is because in this reaction, the net changes the movement, the transfer of the H from carbon one onto the carbon two. And so this is nothing more than an oxidation reduction reaction in which this triose phosphate isomerase, uh, isomerase basically transforms this ketose into an aldose by transferring the H from carbon one onto this carbon number two. So we see that triose phosphate isomerase TPI catalyzes the conversion of the ketose, the uh, DHAP into the aldose, the GAP via an intramolecular oxidation reduction reaction in which a hydrogen is transferred from carbon one onto carbon two. So this is a ketose because we have the carbon attached onto two carbons here. This is an aldose because we have an H and a carbon atom attached to the carbon of the carbonyl. Now that's the general idea of what happens, but what exactly happens within the active side of this enzyme? So let's take a look at the following 
four picture diagram. So let's begin with diagram one. Now, if we go into the active side of this enzyme, we'll basically see a bunch of these alpha beta barrels. So we'll see these structures and in the active side, there are basically two catalytic residues that catalyze this reaction and they catalyze via an acid base reaction. So we'll see exactly what that means in just a moment. So what are these two catalytic residues? Well, we have the glue 165 and the his 90. Now, the glue 165 in the first step acts as a base, and the His 195 in the first step acts as an acid. So, essentially, this histidine 95 donates an H to this carbon. So, essentially, this pi bond here goes on to take the H away. At the same time, this acts as a base and takes away that H. And so what happens is once this bond is broken, when the H is taken away, this reforms a pi bond between this carbon one and this carbon two to form this intermediate that contains two alcohol groups. And that's why we call it an anadiol intermediate diol simply means we have two hydroxyl, two alcohol groups, one here and one here. Now, by the way, if we take this molecule and we flip it upside down, this is basically the orientation of this molecule here. So this is carbon one, carbon one, carbon two, carbon two, and carbon three, carbon three. Now let's move on to this second step. In the second step, this basically, so this molecule, this nitrogen that lost an H shown here, basically acts as a base, takes away the H, from this oxygen. And so once we take away that, uh, that H, we form this intermediate. Now, this intermediate is not very stable because it contains a negative charge on the oxygen. And so that negative charge wants to go away. And so what happens is, this lone pair of electrons and this oxygen forms a pi bond. At the same time, the, uh, this pi bond here between carbon one and two actually breaks and those two electrons in the pi bond go and grab that H atom shown in blue. And this is the same uh, H atom that was initially attached onto carbon number one. And so we see that's how the carbon moves from carbon one to carbon number two as a result of this process. So in this process, the H is temporarily transferred onto the oxygen from carbon one and then carbon two grabs that same H away from that oxygen of this catalytic residue. And so in the final step, we basically form this molecule, the aldose, our gap, and we also reform these two catalytic residues of the enzyme because remember, enzymes are never actually used up at the end, they have to be regenerated. And so ultimately, this is the process by which this catalysis reaction actually takes place. Now, there are two important things that this enzyme triose phosphate isomerase actually does. Number one is, is it greatly increases the rate of the reaction. And that's not surprising because that's exactly what catalysts actually do. But the rate at which it increases is by a value of 10 billion. And that's a very, very high rate. That's why we say this reaction is very, very rapid. It takes place very quickly. Now, the second thing, important thing that the enzyme actually does is it creates this pocket of space that places this molecule in close proximity with these two catalytic residues. So that speeds up the reaction. But what it also does is it prevents other reactions, competing reactions from actually taking place. For instance, let's suppose this enzyme was not here. If the enzyme was not here, what exactly would be the pathway of this molecule right over here? Well, instead of following this pathway, another reaction that would be 100 times more likely to actually take place in the absence of this enzyme is this reaction here. And so instead of forming this final product, this molecule will be 100 times more likely to go on and form this molecule here. And that's, why and, and that's why it's so important that 
this enzyme is actually here because in the uh, in the absence of this enzyme this DHAP would go on to form the anodial intermediate but then the anodial intermediate would be 100 times more likely to go on and form this product which we actually don't want to form and so what this enzyme does is it basically stops these competing reactions from actually taking place and the way that it stops them is it places this molecule into this active site into this perfect environment in which these catalytic residues can actually interact and promote this specific type of reaction and that's why we need this triose phosphate isomerase in the cell because it's the molecule that can very quickly and rapidly transform this molecule dihydroxyacetone phosphate into the molecule that we want. So the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. So to conclude, we see that the point of stage two is to take this fructose 1,6-bisphosphate that was formed in stage one and to transform it into two identical glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate molecules. But the way that actually takes place